Hey everybody, this is Frankie Slauson, and welcome to another great edition of the Frankie Slauson Show. And I'm your host, Frankie Slauson. And today we got a, a well, I, I could say an up-and-coming, but more or less legendary uh, comedian. Uh, he, he was on the last comic standing, if you remember back in the days of it, uh, when it was on NBC. Uh, here is Dante. How's it going? I'm great, buddy. You made it sound like it was a hundred years ago, it was like three years ago. <laughs> You're hey, I had to be. I had to throw a joke in there too, you know. That's right. That's right. Thanks so, for having me on, buddy. Yeah. Well, hey, no problem. I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that we could do this. Absolutely. Your show is my my 13th favorite show in the world. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, anyway, so uh, let, well, let's get into it. Uh, how did you uh, get into being a, or what? What made you want to become a comic? Um, I've always wanted to be a comic, man. Even since I was like a little kid, I actually the first time I ever did stand up, I was probably seven or eight years old. I uh, I lived on a military base called China Lake, out in the middle of the Mojave Desert in California, and we would get these USO shows. And this one time, we had this improv group come through. And I was already a fan of stand-up. Like, I owned Bill Cosby albums, and I would sneak in and listen to my parents' Richard Pryor stuff, and all this other stuff. And so when this group came through, I watched it with a little friend of mine who was my age, and I was like, we should do stand-up comedy. Yeah. So we, we formed a little, like, comedy team, and we wrote some jokes, and we did it for our school, and we killed, and so they, like, sent us to all the classrooms to do it for them, and... Uh, they put us in the talent show, and I think they even sent us to, like, another school to go perform for them. And then we would charge people in our backyard to see our stand-up. And then uh, he moved away, so I didn't do stand-up. And then my, my dad got a job offer in San Diego, and the first thing I noticed was there was a comedy club in San Diego. So we moved there, and when I was, like, 14 years old, I turned to another friend of mine in drama class, and I was like, dude, I, I'm, I'm a stand-up comic. You want to do what think? So we did it as a team for like three years called Dante and the Wolf. And then I split off from him and kept performing. And I, I had kind of a fake ID early on. Because this guy Ace on Love, do you know who he is? Uh, I'm not too sure. I don't think I know him. He's, he's in a million movies. He's the big fat black guy in Elf. He plays the like, manager oh, okay. of the model. Okay. Um, he was Big Worm and Friday. Anyway, he and I went to high school together. And he was a doorman at the comedy store when he was like 17 and so I told him to tell everyone that I'm like 19 now even though I was only like 15 <laughs> so when I turned 17 they'll believe I'm 21 and so that's what we did and I ended up being the doorman there and working with all these great comedians I mean I used to get to work with and meet and, and, and end up like opening for like Andrew Dice Clay and, and uh Paul Rodriguez and Sam Kennison and Richard Pryor. So that is the story of how I got into stand-up. And you, you got to work with a lot of different legendary figures. I mean, Andy Nice Clay and Sam Kennison. I mean, wow, that's that's a, that's a good way to get started, I'd say. Yeah, no kidding, man. I had good teachers, and they all taught me a lot of things. But the main thing they taught me was to have fun and be funny. You know oh, what I sure. mean? Like, some comics forget that being funny is part of the job. Like, you think that you'd realize that's, like, a big part of the job. But a lot of comics, they think that they're just good writers and that the writing is going to, you know? But if you're not up on stage having fun and being funny, then you, you know, you lose that. Sure. And it's like, you know, Richard Pryor said to me, basically, we're, we're up there to make people laugh. So what I got from that is, if you're a guitar comic, you're a mime, whatever you are, if you're on a stand-up comedy stage, if you make them laugh, you're a comic. Oh, sure. There is a standard that you have to stand there for an hour with a microphone only. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Huh. Well, that's that's cool. Yeah, uh, uh, Richard Pryor. And, and like, uh, were you ever inspired, like, by George Carlin at all? You know, man, I like some of his early stuff, but I am one of those weirdo comics that isn't a giant George Carlin fan. I felt like George Carlin was really funny in his earlier years and then for like the past 15 years I gave it a shot man every time a new you know special came out or anything I just it didn't seem like it was funny you know what I mean like it, I, I don't know like 
sway anyone's tongue because he's a genius, but I just felt like he felt like he was George Carlin and people were going to laugh at whatever he said. And I think even fans, you know, felt the same way because if, if I said some of the same jokes on stage without you knowing it was George Carlin's joke, I don't think a lot of people would laugh. But because it was George Carlin and in your mind you're already saying he's a genius, I feel like a lot of people gave him credit for some real bullshit that he was putting out. <laughs> yeah, because uh, it seemed like yeah, he, he wanted to be known as the uh, controversial... <laughs> Uh, comic, more or less. Right, and he was in his younger years, and that's when I really, really liked him. It was just later in life I felt like, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, like, uh, how how would you rate yourself as a comic? Would you say you're more uh, a clean comic, or more of a dirty comic, or right in between? Dude, I'm everything comic. Like, if I, I just played uh, a corporate show today at, at June. Oh. For Somewhere where I had to do a half hour squeaky clean. Okay. And if I uh, go to some bar tomorrow night that's filthy, I can do filthy. Okay. I think I pride myself on I can play to any audience. It could be all gay, it could be all black, all Latino, all the white, old, young, corporate, filthy, bikers. It doesn't matter because I have material for everything. Cause what I talk about is just the human experience. So. It doesn't matter, you know, if we all share the exact experience, but we share the things. Yeah. We all have fans, we all, we all drive, we all know, you know, about religion and race and all the things that make up the world, and that's all I talk about. Oh, sure. Yeah, and, 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 you know, it's it's nice to have a story with your jokes and stuff like that, you know. If you tell a story and, and include it in your jokes, people are probably going to understand what you're t- trying to get at. Do you but, ta- do you talk about the economy at all in your jokes at all, or like the like what's going on like uh, with like the like world tragedies or anything like that? You know what I mean? Like so it seems, seems like a lot of comics like to talk about a lot of real world issues and then make jokes out of them. Well, you know, dude, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll incorporate stuff for a little bit into my act, but not all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you don't want to talk about the presidential race in your act because that material is going to be good for like three months. Yeah, you know, be like, why waste it? And most comics, even even though I mean, most people have never seen a comic. Like I've been a comic twenty six years, and I've performed in front of, you know, probably forty million on television or more, sure. and probably over a million live. But even if they come back to my show, some people still want to hear certain jokes, which I don't. You know, it's probably going to be the same show. But I'm just saying, like. You don't need to keep it topical and fresh. I'm not Jay Leno. I'm not doing a daily show where, you know, 10 million people are watching me every single night and I have to keep up with the news. Sure. I would rather throw in something here or there into my act that I can switch the next time it happens. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. even if it is a political joke, I just save it for the next time there's a election. So were you ever a big fan of, like, uh, SCTV or Saturday Night Live? Huge, huge. SCTV was good, but Saturday Night Live I grew up on, man. I loved it. Like, I was addicted to it, especially the old, like, original cast. Oh, sure. I liked, I liked every cast. I mean, I really, like, even while they're on, we end up hating the cast, but then, like, a couple years later, it's nostalgic, and then you end up liking the cast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I've always been a huge fan. Like, I, I wish I were on Saturday Night Live. Yeah, I'm surprised they never asked you to come on and, and be like a, a guest host. I'm sure you could rock the crowd. I'm sure you'd be pretty funny. Dude, I would love to, because I do tons of characters and impressions in my act, and I could do a lot of people. The problem is it's in New York, and so I'm just never there for the audition. Yeah. Yeah, so. I suppose. Yeah, because it's not in California. I guess I got to realize that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's in New York. It's not in California. They should do like oh. this California Saturday Night Live show. You know, like come to California for a week or whatever, and then, you know let whoever wants to be on audition for a guest host spot and see how it goes or whatever. Yeah, it would be nice if they had some, like, satellite editions and then they pick a couple people and fly them in New York, but I just, if they do it, I don't know about it. <laughs> so, like, uh, uh, everybody, uh, most people know that you were our last comic standing. How did you, uh, who, who did you hear from the, that got you in- interested in uh, participating in that? Well, nobody, because, you know, every comic wanted to do it, um, even famous comics. There were a lot of famous comics that tried out or even got on the show 
Uh, and then some I got on the show that on, on you know that never even aired. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I just heard about it. I auditioned for two years in a row, and then the final year, I like. I just decided this is my year. I'm getting on, and I asked people who had been on the show for advice, and I went and just did everything people told me, and I got on. And, then, and they didn't even, yeah. even if they didn't want me on, I won my way onto the show because they have something called the, um, like it's like a people's choice. So when you perform in front of these live audiences, they get to pick someone to go on to the next round, and every single round they picked me. Yeah, so I, I noticed that. Yeah. yeah. The audience has picked me instead of the producers, so whether they wanted me or not, I got on. Yeah, I saw the I saw the YouTube video on that. Uh, uh, I was pretty uh, I was pretty blown away by your impressions of uh, Robert De Niro and Jack Nicholson and uh, Christopher Lloyd and Gilbert Godfrey. That was pretty <laughs> that was pretty fucking hilarious, man. Oh, thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Yeah. And uh, now, now you're doing a, a show because I know my friend Brendan Mitchell, who you're good friends with, uh, Wet Movie One yeah. on YouTube. Uh, I love him. Yeah, he, you're doing a show called the Stimulus Package. What's that about it for people who don't know? <laughs> well, people can listen to the Stimulus Package live every Monday and Tuesday, except uh, on holidays, obviously. Yeah. But it's Monday and Tuesday. All they have to do is go to the GoCastNetwork.com, G O C A S T Network.com. Every Tuesday from 7 to 8 uh, Pacific Standard Time, and we do an hour show, and it is a podcast with me and my girlfriend, who's a well-known actress. She's a star of, like, 20 horror films and, like, 10 gay comedies and is, like, a gay icon. Oh, wow. And then my friend, Andrew Ramos, who's a comedian. So the three of us host it, and we always have a lot of celebrities on the show and singers and porn stars and comedians and actors and... Like John Lovitz was on the show this week. Um, last week we had a guy who played Long Duck Dong from 16. Yeah, Kansas. that's what uh, Brendan was saying. Yeah, he told yeah, me that. Jay from Jay and Silent Bob has been on the show. So we've had a lot of big, you know, people. And if people want to listen to it, like even right now, just um, I think we're on Ustream. I know we are. Just you look up Stimulus Package or Stimulus Package Podcast. And then we have the Monday one Stimulus Package. Tuesday is called Stimulus Package After Dark, okay. and there is a difference. The After Dark one, we get more raunchy, and it's more of a party, and sometimes everybody's drunk, and <laughs> but you can go to iTunes and look up both. Look up Stimulus Package and look up Stimulus Package After Dark on iTunes, and we have at least 40 episodes that people can listen to to get into it, and then after the new year, they can uh, finish live if they want. You can watch us on GoCast. So and, that's nice. and how and, and who came up with the the name for the title? Uh, my girlfriend. She's very political, and she thought it sounded like a fun title, stimulus package. Yeah. Got double entendres. Huh. Yeah, it, it well, sounds sounds pretty cool. It's, it sounds like the almost like the the stimulus package that they keep talking about on you know for the economy and everything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and we are political on the show. Like we push a lot of. Uh, things, and, and, and we show both sides, you know what I mean, like, like I'm kind of in the middle, I am, uh, I, I'm considered liberal, but I'm also conservative, and my girlfriend's completely liberal, my friend who's on the show could give a shit, <laughs> but we still have conservative Republicans on our show, you know, like, sure. Victoria Jackson from Saturday Night Live on the show, and she is a hardcore conservative Republican, and her and my girlfriend kind of got into a little debate, and you know, whatever, but that's fun. It's supposed to show both sides. So have you ever got a chance to do anything on, like, satellite radio at all? Have I got to do L.A. radio? No, like, satellite radio, like, uh, like perform, like, do, like, a show for uh, satellite radio, like, Sirius or um, I think I've been on there, because people told me to put me on there doing stand-up, but, no, I think, I mean, those guys have their own show, kind of like, you know, just like I do over at GoCast, so. Okay. I just figure yeah, it out. I've been a guest on satellite radio, and I've uh, had my stand up on like X and Sirius and all that. Oh, huh, that's cool. So, any any big shows uh, that you're going to do for Christmas or the New Year's at all? Dude, no. Today, that corporate show that I did was my last one until January, but I run a show every Wednesday in LA. It's in Rolling Stone, LA, which is this cool bar, restaurant, theater, club. 
and uh, me and Dennis Haskins, who was Mr. Belding on Saved by the Bell, oh, yeah. who hosts every week, and my girlfriend, we run comedy there every Wednesday from 9 to 11. And uh, so I have that. I've also been writing for a TV show lately. And then I, I go out of town and do a bunch of gigs all the time. But I do want to mention, um, I, 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 I got paid to write and direct a movie. I wrote it, and I filmed it, I think, in the spring. So I don't know when it comes out. But right now, it's tentatively titled Paranormal Nightmare. It's going to be a spoof comedy movie of those, like, paranormal activity movies. Sure. And then I'm in a movie with Adrian Brody, Michelle Rodriguez, and Rob Schneider and Lindsay Lohan. It comes out March 22nd called The Inappropriate Comedy, where I have a big part in the movie. Oh, wow. And according to all the test audiences, my scene is the best in the whole movie. <laughs> and funny. Well, that, that looks pretty... That, that sounds kind of interesting to, to, to know that you got something cool in the books uh, for people to look forward to pretty soon. Absolutely, man. And I also work in commercials a lot. Like, I've been in commercials, like, filler beer commercials and so on, but I also, like, write, direct, produce. Um, I helped uh, I helped the ShamWow guy, you know? Ian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that on your website. I went to your website yeah, and saw that. Yeah, you know, we made a, a, a product called the Shticky, which is like a lead roller that is reusable, and I even came up with the name Shticky because it's stand-up. Yeah. <laughs> they do. Um, but anyway, that's in stores, and if you check out the box, if you're looking around and you see the box, I made that box. Like, I directed the photos, I, I even wrote the instructions inside. Wow. Um, and I just worked on a, a new ShamWow thing, which I don't know when that commercial airs, but pretty soon, I think, before Christmas, maybe, maybe, maybe just after, but, so there's a new ShamWow product coming out that huh. we just did, so well, that'll be out soon. Oh, that's cool. No, it, it sounds like you're a very busy guy, but very creative guy, too. I mean, wow. You know, I didn't even know that you even did a lot of this stuff that you're telling me prior to looking at your website, but wow. I mean, that's uh, you You definitely uh, have accomplished a lot in, in the 40 few years you've been around so far. <laughs> oh, thanks, buddy. Yeah, yeah I try. I mean, like, it's funny. When I look back at my life, it seems like it comes in segments, you know? Yeah. Like, there's a whole lifetime of being in, in San Diego just starting comedy. And then in the 90s, I was the most famous white comic on BET. Yeah. So I had a whole different life then, you know what I mean? Like, I was being shuttled around in limos and being flown to all these, you know, where, like, two people were showing up to just see me. <laughs> um... I even, like, hold record for winning the most BET awards and all this shit. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, there's the last comic standing part of my life. Now there's this part of my life. And, you know, the movies I've done along the way. And there was a period in, like, the early 2000s where I was the president, or it's called the Abbott, at the, um, at the Friars Club in, in L.A. And that took up a big part of my life. Huh. So it's just crazy looking back on my life just thinking about all the crazy things I've you know so you got any goals for the next for the upcoming year at all what you want to accomplish or what you're trying to accomplish uh, here's, here's one of the things I want is when I start directing that movie I'm in it and so is my girlfriend and there's going to be some celebrities in it I just want it to be great because it's not a giant Hollywood blockbuster and it's also not a low budget it's somewhere in the middle and we can make it great and the script is great and I want that. That's one of my big goals. I also uh, did these, I produced these comedy DVDs that are coming out soon. And I don't know if we're going to put them, like, directly on, like, HBO or Showtime or uh, the Shamrock guy was even talking about how he might want to, like, sell them on TV for me. Oh, wow. Um, but they're great. And each one has a different theme. Like, we have an all-woman show called, uh, what is that called? Uh, Funny with a Chance of Blue Balls. <laughs> we have uh, an all handicap show called The Cripple Kings of Comedy. We have uh, a gay show called The Gay List. We have one where it's a salute to the U.S. troops. Um, I have my one man show, and then we have an all pot show. It's called uh, 420 Comedy Explosion. <laughs> so a little bit of for everybody. <laughs> yeah, dude. So, so those will be out. Um, I just want things to really happen. Like, I need to get, you know, uh, more. I want to stay in town more. I, I, I've spent 26 years on the road doing like 50 weeks a year, and I just want, like, luckily I'm, I, I got this TV show that I'm writing for, and it's a big one, 
And, uh, you know, between that and some other things in L.A., like working with the Shamma guy and running this room, I may not have to go out on the road as much, which would be nice. I'd like to go out maybe, maybe 20 times a year. Huh. So that's, my, that's my goal. Make so much money in L.A. that I never have to leave unless I want to. Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, maybe it's just a time where you're trying to realize that you know you've done you you've accomplished a lot more than you probably thought you ever would accomplish, and now it's time to to plan for the future more or less. More. <laughs> yeah, and you know what, dude, I, I I rarely speak of this, but I invented something, and I told the Shamrock guy about it, and he's a good friend of mine, and would, he always says no to anybody that says that they have a good idea. And he loves my idea, and so hopefully we will produce it and sell it on TV within the year. And that's my ultimate goal, because this thing is going to be so great, anybody from a child to a grandma is going to want it. And it's not a little, like, tchotchke item. It's not something you throw away or go, hey, that's kind of neat. I should fight, you know, to give to someone. This is something everyone will want, and I can't talk about it. Yeah. But... It is, uh, it's revolutionizing an industry and making something so much better. And the way I came up with it is I needed it. And I looked it up on the Internet to see where I could buy this, and I realized, man, I, apparently no one sells it. I just made it up. So I called the patent office and found out how to get this patented, and uh, I patented my idea and all this. And so after uh, this uh, ShamWow stuff comes out, I think that's the next project we're going to work on. Well, that'll be cool. Well, I tell you what, I, I appreciate you uh, let me interview you, and uh, I hope you have a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and thanks again for uh, taking the time to be part of my show. Dude, I loved being on it. Uh, yes, uh, if, you're, if you ever want to be a guest at one of my shows, man, I'd love to have you. And just for your listeners, go to comicdante.com. You can find out where I'm going to be near you. I'm always somewhere in the country. I think in January I'm going to Little Rock, Arkansas, and some other places. Thanks for having me on, brother. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we can always do something in the future if you want. If you ever want me on your show, I'd be I'd be happy to be a guest. <laughs> That'd be great, man. All right. Uh, well, thank you, and uh, we'll see you later. Uh, All right, everybody. That was Dante the comic, and yeah, that'd be kind of. What do you think about that? Uh, having me on, having Frankie Slauson on the the Stimulus Package podcast, and I'll put the uh, that you can check out on b- below the video. And, uh, yeah, that would be kind of cool. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I'll probably take a long shot there, but, uh, uh, hey, if we can get enough people in support of that, because it's, it's not like I'm not doing anything. It's not like I'm just a regular YouTuber who's just making videos. I mean, I think uh, being able to do interviews and stuff like this uh, could d- definitely expand my horizons as a as a performer or as an entertainer, kind of be somewhat like a informer, but more or less an entertainer as well but in my own type of fashion. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, if you guys think that's a good idea, well, then uh, let Dante know, and uh, yeah, we could probably, uh, that'd be kind of fun to, to have on. Anyway, I'm Frank Slauson, and uh, we'll see you again in the next one.